so we'll start with a little trivia question, which, you know, I always like to do. And so this is a recycled, often used one, but it's one of my favorite ones. So if you if you know the answer, you can give it. But if you know the answer and you think you should know the answer because you've been through it 20 times, you might wait for somebody else to do it, Charles. So we'll see. Uh, <laughs> we'll see how that turns out. But what uh, were the Hebrew names of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Well, I'll have to... that will be our trivia question today. <laughs> the Hebrew names of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Are you yeah, wanting to those... answer right now? Yeah, go ahead and answer. And I'll... Oh, it's not me. Pat has an answer. Pat. Okay, Pat. Pat, go and show your face, too. That'd be fine. <laughs> well, he's on the other side of the room. <laughs> oh, is he in trouble again? Ezra. Michelle and Azariah? Is that two of them? Is that two? That's two of them, yes. Just like I guess for. he's done. <laughs> two more, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry he's in time out over there. Belteshazzar and Hananiah. Very close, very close. Let's look at. What? Are we mumbling now? <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. So let's look at Daniel 1 6. That's the easiest place, though it's in two. Daniel 1 6 and Daniel 1 11. Among these, these were some from Judah Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So actually, the Hebrew name of Daniel is Daniel. So that's where we were a little off. But we don't call Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah because Shabrak, Meshach, and Abednego is much more catchy. So the chief official gave the new names to Daniel, the name Belteshazzar. So he was Belteshazzar in, in his uh, Persian, Persian uh, personality or name. To Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Now, one reason, and for those of you who don't usually do a Bible study with this, I like to do a trivia question because I like the idea of trying to find something in Scripture based on the clues available. And, of course, it makes sense that Daniel would be named in Daniel 1. And I just like to be able to navigate the Bible that way, thinking about the history, the time, the location, the ability to find something in the Bible. I think it's a good thing. So... When I look at my footnote, though, which it would be, you know, that's not a, a real fair part of the uh, asking. So that's why I wouldn't ask that as a trivia question. I like to have the scriptural answer. But if you look at, if I look at my footnote, Daniel means God is my judge. Hananiah means the Lord shows grace. Mishael means, these are all Hebrew, means who is what God is. And Azariah means the Lord helps. You might notice all four of those. God's my judge. The Lord shows grace. What is God? Who is what God is? And the Lord helps are all very scriptural or very godly oriented terms. So they were changed to Belteshazzar means Bel or Murdoch protect, protect his life. Bel was um, and Murdoch, the same one, was the false god of Persia. Shadrach means command of Aku, the Sumerian moon god. So he got changed from the Lord shows grace to the Sumerian moon god, Sumeria being a province of Persia. Meshach means who is what Aku is, rather than who is who God is, who is what Aku is. You might recognize Aku from part of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Persia, was the... Uh, the deity for the king of Persia. And then Abednego means servant of Nega or Nebu or Nebu, which is also the name Nebuchadnezzar. So basically the, the king had two false god names and they changed these Hebrew boys' names to uh, names that fit the gods of Persia. So it reminds me when we think about um, spiritual warfare that things are so often based on God versus false gods, or God versus Satan, or God, you know, the angels and the demons, the spiritual realm and the earthly realm, heaven and hell. So what is the basis of any given war? Think about any war in time. You could think about 
you know, the Persian takeover of Israel. You can think about the Great War, the Korean War. What, did, what does any given war have as its basis? A lot of times it's economic. It's what? I'm sorry. A lot of times there's economic reasons for war. Yes, economic. What else? Two conflicting beliefs. Yes, absolutely. Conflicting beliefs. Conflict, economics. Conflict with economics. What else generally? Wanting what someone else has. Absolutely. Possession, land, you know, uh, access to water, access to yeah. crops, um, you know, that type of thing. So uh, those basically define nearly any war in time is based on conflict over possession, which can be economic or it can be territory or it can be people of control. So I would boil down to control of people, control of people and their possessions. And I think that's true, really, of virtually any war over time. Sometimes it's like brothers fighting over the father's territory that who has subsequently died or things like that. But almost always it's conflict about power over the souls. And that's what spiritual warfare is. It's about conflict over power over our souls or where our souls choose to lend their obedience, lend their um, obeisance or the worship of the uh, the one in power. So let's look at, when we talk about conflict and spiritual warfare in the Bible, I think it is of interest to, uh, uh, and if you want to write down verses, look at them later or whatever, that's fine, follow along the Bible, but I'll try to announce them with enough time for you to turn there, but it'd be Hebrews 11.1. 1. We're going to be at Hebrews 11.1, 1, and in a minute we'll be back to Hebrews, so you might keep a finger there, but I think it's important to realize, too, that when talking about spiritual warfare, the challenge with spiritual warfare is that it is, by definition, invisible to us. So when we talk about, you know, angels, demons, seraphs, cherubim, God, the 24 elders in heaven, the four creatures, the six creatures, the four creatures in Ezekiel and Revelation, the six creatures in Isaiah, any of those things, or the serpent in the garden, uh, they are inherently invisible to us. Maybe the serpent in the garden is the worst example there, but you know we weren't there, and we and the serpent apparently changed in that process of being cursed by God for bringing about sin in the world, which we'll read here in a minute. But I think it's of interest that all those things are invisible to us. So I think it's fair to establish that it's reasonable to study the invisible to be aware of the invisible so at hebrews 11 1 now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see you know the difference in faith and just testimony or just realization maybe is a better term is that with a realization you know if i were sitting here in my library and jesus walked in i could touch him like thomas said touch his wounds uh, you know, be palpably aware he's here. If instead I believe by faith that he is here because he is, then obviously that's faith and that's based on the invisible. So uh, it's certain of what we do not see. So then if we were to um, turn just briefly over Colossians 1.15. Turn there real quick. At Colossians 1.15. He is the image, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. So, you know, obviously there tells us that God created the visible and the invisible, and uh, that's primarily the realm we'll be discussing. So... I thought we'd also go over a few terms that will have application to what we're saying so that we we know what we're talking about in terms of the discussion. So I looked up a few just flat out definitions because I thought it'd be interesting to see what the world's view is on these terms as opposed to, you know, what we see in scripture. But I looked up angel and this is on dictionary um, app whatever it is, dictionary.com, I suppose. 
And the first definition of angel is one of a class of spiritual beings, a celestial attendant of God. In medieval angelology, angelology, which I didn't really, I've never been a student of medieval angelology, angels constituted the lowest of nine celestial orders. Seraphim, cherubim, thrones, dominions and dominations, virtues, powers, principalities or princedoms, archangels, and angels. So angels are presumably by that definition the lowest of the spiritual celestial beings. The third definition is the one I would say we find in scripture, which is a messenger, especially of God. So a messenger would be an angel. The others it mentioned, seraphim and cherubim are the well that's the plural of seraph and cherub and seraph is rare, rarely found in scripture but is a heavenly being that's around the throne of God and seems to be able to do certain duties for God at his command. A cherub is um, more of a, uh, is another spiritual being that's mentioned a little more often and famous for, I think, two things in particular. One is guarding the gates to Eden after Adam and Eve have been cast out. And the other is having the representation on the Ark of the Covenant as the, the literal seat of God between the wings of the cherub on the Ark of the Covenant. So that's those are a couple of the heavenly bodies. I'm not really sure how thrones become heavenly bodies, but in that definition, it's mentioned next. Dominations or dominions had presumably be some realm of power, which we'll talk about in a subsequent week. Uh, powers, principalities, virtues. Virtues is uh, mentioned, and that's sort of an interesting spiritual being. I'm not sure I'd agree there either. So that was the earthly definition of angel we'll look in scripture find other terms and now I'll just read the uh, definition of satan the chief evil spirit the great adversary of humanity the devil meaning literally from latin and greek from uh each term is transliterated s-a-t-a-n uh satan meaning adversary okay so that's another one let's see if there's another of interest demon i looked up um and got an ad and demon is an evil spirit devil or fiend which i think we'd probably agree with some sort of minion of satan devil is defined in it says in theology the supreme spirit of evil or satan sometimes with the initial capital letter and sometimes not a subordinate evil spirit with enmity with God, having power to afflict humans both with bodily disease and with spiritual corruption, is the definition of devil given there. So just, we'll look at some scriptural comments too on them and see what uh, we read about them. But let's look at Hebrews 1 now. Hebrews 1, we'll do right at chapter 1, verse, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and read one one real quick here on in the past god spoke to our forefathers through the prophets but many times in various ways but in these last days he has spoken to us by his son whom he appointed heir of all things and through him he made the universe the sun is the radiance of god's glory and the exact representation of his being sustaining all things by his powerful word after he had provided purification for sins he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven so he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs so it establishes, the Hebrew author here establishes that Jesus is superior to the angels. And of course, we would, I think, agree readily because God is superior to the angels. If he created everything visible and invisible, then he created angels and is therefore superior to them. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I've become your father. Or again, I will be his father, he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. In speaking of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds, his servants flames of fire. But about the sun, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever, and righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above the companions by anointing you with the oil joy. He also says, in the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, the heavens and the work of, the, of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. 
they all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe. Like a garment, they'll be changed, but you remain the same. And your years will never end. To which of the angels did God ever say, set my right hand till I make your enemies foot so of for your feet? Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? So even though he says, hi, Steve, your list is Terry. Good to see you. You and Terry looking more alike over time. He's sitting here in the chair. Okay. Sure she is. Is she in time out too like Pat is? Okay. All right. Very good. Anyway, sorry. Good to see you guys, but I interrupted myself there. Sorry about that. So the um, when uh, talking about the angels here, God says Jesus is as God is above the angels and that the uh, angels are um, available for service to those who will inherit salvation or in other words, to the saints or to the people of God, the Christians or us. So when he also um, mentions here, let's see, um, in putting, this is uh, chapter 2, sorry, I didn't say 2, 8. In putting everything under him, God left nothing that is not subject to him. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. So also the Hebrew author says that Jesus was made a little lower than the angels, but then exalted above them again. And I believe that represents that he was made a man. Men or mankind, uh, people are below the angels. So you would see, you know, God, angels, people in that kind of hierarchy and jesus became a man then went back to the right hand of god and is at the throne of god and above the angels but the angels would be considered theoretically above us in a spiritual hierarchy and probably because they're not bound by the earth that that's not something where they you know they have a they probably it appears have a more infinite lifespan than a human on earth although our soul goes on to live forever and um and then you know until we're in heaven with god they are uh, considered above us by the uh, the nature of god's creation of them before mankind it would appear anybody have any other opinions on that thoughts question sure so when we die and our soul goes to heaven is our position changed to in, in relationship to the angels I believe, yeah. Huh? Yeah, I believe yes. And the reason that the, the uh, my theory on that would be that because we are made in the image of God, there's no indication that the angels are made in the image of God. So I think by being made in God's image, being made as, you know, as we say four or five weeks ago about uh, fellowship and the reason that God created mankind for companionship, and the reason he made people in his own image was, I think, uh, to enhance that relationship etern eternally. Then I believe that once we have died, because the angels are, chapter 114, ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation, that by inheriting salvation, we then uh, achieve something angels cannot. I think angels are bound to service and not to that same kind of relationship to the Lord. So that's that's what I believe on that. Any other opinions, thoughts? I like that thought. You do like it? I do. Me too. I think I think salvation is a good idea. I think I think God had a good plan for us. Absolutely. So the. Um, When, so, yeah, just looking at that angelic situation, I, it reminds me to think about the different ways we know of angels appearing. What ways can you think of that you remember from scripture that where angels have appeared and in what form? Well, to Mary, to Joseph. Yeah, so that was 
specifically to Mary was the angel Gabriel. It was announced that it was Gabriel, the messenger of God, bringing the message. Okay, so we would call Gabriel an archangel because by tradition we do that. Scripturally speaking, it's, um, I don't recall that Gabriel's mentioned as an archangel per se. Michael is. Who's the other archangel we may know by name? Somebody buzz in? Uh, no. <laughs> He's an angel got a ring. Form of a question. Yeah. Another angel got his wings, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, hey, you, are you watching the Bible saying here, John? Donald's <laughs> <It's laughs> fold. Okay. But anybody know the other? There are basically three named angels historically. Michael, Gabriel. Okay. I'll answer that. Raphael. Raphael is actually called the uh, the angel of healing. Raphael appears in uh, some scriptural canons, but not the classic Christian spiritual or uh, scriptural canon of 66 books, 39 the Old Testament, 27 the New Testament. Raphael is not mentioned. Uh, Raphael is mentioned in Jewish scripture and in the Catholic Bible, which has a few more books. So that's, that's where the awareness of Raphael comes from. Um, so in general, you would consider Michael the archangel to be the, uh, the commander of the Lord's army, possibly, or the uh, general of mm -hmm. the Lord's army or some sort of warrior, mm -hmm. um, which is where he's always represented. He's always represented as, as being involved in battle. And then Gabriel's always uh, represented, it, represented as a messenger. So he would be the angel of, of uh, message, a messenger angel on top of being the messengers that all angels seem to be. And then Raphael is perhaps the archangel of healing but that is not in the uh, traditional Christian scriptural canon. So that, and that's kind of a whole different discussion is how we got our 66 books of the Bible, but that's uh, the case. So what other representations I think, oh, and you mentioned uh, Gabriel and then uh, the angel coming to Joseph. How did the angel come to Joseph the three times he did? He told him Mary was with baby, he told him go to Egypt because Herod's killing the babies and he told him come back because Herod was dead. A vision, wasn't it? Uh, yes, it was a vision. Some some uh, translations say a dream. Right. I think vision is a better, more appropriate term for that. But yes, so angels can appear as archangels. Angels can appear in a vision. What else? It's okay for other people to answer to. <laughs> hey, Norm. Yes. Uh for those that don't know that are on here, I was in a very serious accident when I was a kid, a plane crash. And the incidents that happened at that point, I've always believed that God put that person there when that happened. Uh, I believe everything that happened within those few hours up before and after, uh, it was it's obvious to me, no one looking back now, that God had a big part in that. What are the person that pulled me out of the plane? I've always wondered whether the person that pulled me out of the plane was an angel or not. Mm -hmm. And I don't know uh, if you could tag that person an angel necessarily, but it was. It, but if you hear the, if you go through step by step the story of the account of what happened, uh, God most certainly had a had a hand in that. Absolutely, I would agree. And as you said, I know you know from our discussions quite a bit about your your situation there. And I think that was a miraculous recovery. There are few people who, who lived through plane crashes. And um, I know you lost your dad in that plane crash. And so it obviously was significant enough to cause death. And the fact you were spared, I think is quite incredible. And out in the middle of a field where there were, you know, not a lot of first responders waiting around to help you out. So I think you're right. So we would say from that, that the representation of the the, the way an angel appears can be in the form of a person, right? Did that happen in scripture as well? Yeah, where? Yeah, when, when the angels met Abraham. Yeah, absolutely. Before the destruction of the five cities of the Eastern Plain, mm -hmm. including Sodom and Gomorrah, that got the most famous uh, coverage for it. But the, um, 
that was, uh, they appeared as men. And it's mm -hmm. interesting because in that scriptural example from Genesis where they came as men, they also ate with Abram. They slept when they went over a visit lot. And so they did human-like things. And then as two went down to the city, uh, cities of Sodom and Gomorrah where Lot was, one saved behind and was after they had in scripture been referred to as men or angels. Then it said, the Lord said to Abram and began to talk to him. So, uh, you know, it, it may be that God was with them as well and was in the form of a man because as we understand, we can't gaze on the face of God and live. So, you know, if he came in the form of a man, hey, Charles, uh, if he came in the form of a man, then I think, you know, that would keep Abram from dying when he saw him. Charles? I think several times in scriptures, God speaks through angels. It says the Lord said. Yes. Uh, when, it, when you get down to it, like in the burning bush. Yes. Excellent example. It says God spoke, but we find out later. When Jacob uh, wrestled uh, mm -hmm. on, his, on his way back to Canaan. Uh, Canaan right, he wrestled remember. with a man, and then he realized this was either an angel or God represented right. in that man. Yes. And same, you're right with the burning bush, because it talks about uh, being in the presence of God, but yet the reference is to an angel, the Lord speaking to Moses. So... I believe you're right. And if we view that as, you know, the, the messenger of God being the angel, the ministry messenger, ministering messenger of God, then it would make sense that the angel would not have his own message. He would carry the words of God to the person. So you're right. I think it is the way that God can present himself to people, again, without them dying in his presence. Remember that in Exodus 48, when the tabernacle was finished, the Ark of the Covenant was placed in the Holy of Holies, and no one could be in the presence of God as he entered that chamber because they would have died, including Moses. It states that Moses had to uh, leave the Holy of Holies before God came to uh, rest on the Ark of the Covenant because it would have killed Moses. So I think, you know, given all that, given that power of God I think he used angels maybe use as angels still present tense because if God himself appeared to us we would not be able to live in the presence live as a physical body in the presence of God so those are excellent examples what others anybody think of any others Zechariah okay and that representation uh, uh, he was told that that Elizabeth would have a son? Yes, so he was also uh, reached by Gabriel. That uh, Gabriel went to him with that message and then to um, Mary shortly thereafter. So that was the archangel also. And at the, at the tomb, there was an angel came. Yeah, absolutely. The, the angel rolled the stone away and then was sitting right. at the tomb with the the face shield that have been on Jesus said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Absolutely. And they were able to withstand the presence there. Um, primarily, you know, Mary was terrified at Gabriel's presence. So I'll just run through a couple more in the interest of time. Those are all excellent examples and true. The others I would say is sometimes angels are invisible, but yet very physically present, like in the story of Balaam and the donkey. The angel blocked the donkey's way. The angel made the donkey divert into the wall and upsetting Balaam, so he beat him. And they blocked the way and then appeared to Balaam after God allowed the donkey to speak and say, why have you beaten me these three times? I'm, you know, following the will of God, this angel ahead of me. So invisibility uh, was also a representation. There also were the chariots of fire that surrounded Elijah, as he was taken up into heaven and uh, showed in the hillside when Elisha showed his servant that they were not alone, that they had a heavenly host with them. And they are represented as either horse riding or chariot riding, depending on the translation you see. So that was another way. And then, of course, I think 
one of the uh, big ones uh, that comes on, there were appearances of angels as angels we've seen, we seem to feel. So in Daniel, let's look at that, Daniel 10. So that's one of them. And then the other one that stands out in my mind is, of course, um, the appearance of uh, in heaven in Revelation when uh, John was able to see into heaven and saw the heavenly hosts and the various creatures, which I would include in that the seraphim, the cherubim, the uh, 24 elders, the creatures with four faces or six, depending on, or four wings or six, excuse me, four faces. And uh, then we'll look at Daniel's vision of an angel here in verse chapter 10, Daniel 10, 1. Mm -hmm. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel, who was called Belteshazzar. We know Daniel's Hebrew name, of course. Uh, its message was true, and it concerned a great war. Speaking of spiritual warfare there, the understanding of the message came to him in a vision. At that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no meat, no wine, touched my lips. I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. On the 24th day of the first month, I was standing on the bank of the as I was saying, on the bank of the great river, the Tigris, I looked up and there before me is a man dressed in linen with a belt of finest gold around his waist. His body was like chrysolite. His face was like lightning. His eyes like flaming torches. His arms and legs like a gleam of burnished bronze. And his voice like the sound of a multitude. I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. The men with me did not see it, but such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves. So they didn't even see the angel and they were terror stricken. So I was left alone gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale and I was helpless. Then I heard him speaking. And as I listened to him, I fell into a deep sleep, my face to the ground. A hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed, consider carefully the words I'm about to speak to you. And stand up, for I have now been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up trembling. So uh, let me read just a few more verses just because it um, it'll apply to something I'll talk about here in a minute. Then he continued, do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before God, your God, your words were heard. And I've come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now I've come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future, for the vision concerns a time yet to come. So the two, to me, the big keys there, three keys, are that the people with Daniel didn't even see this angel and they were terrified and fled. The second was Daniel, who had set up against the commander of Nebuchadnezzar's crew when he said we'll eat vegetables you feed the other people the junk and let's see who's healthier he set up to the king and presented to the king when he had a dream that brought bad news for king nebuchadnezzar he spent a night with hungry lions and was absolved by god and uh, nebuchadnezzar actually darius in that case realized who was the true god based on daniel's strength to overcome and God closing the mouths of the lions. And Daniel made it through all of those and then was in the presence of this angel and was so terrified that he was trembling, fell down, and essentially passed out. And I think that's a powerful vision, a powerful description of what the presence of the angel was like. So then also, as we read, the angel Michael was detained, or the angel that came to David, uh, Daniel, excuse me, was detained for three weeks while Michael and the Prince of Persia fought this out. And the also referred to as the King of Persia shortly thereafter, the Prince of the Persian Kingdom uh, or the uh, King of Persia. So many people, myself included, feel that if there is a an archangel Michael, which I believe there is, he talks about being a chief angel, uh, chief prince, that that archangel Michael seems to have the evil equivalent the king of Persia, the prince of Persia, which could be considered maybe an arch demon or some, some form of that. We don't have that term in scripture. 
But it seems that in the spiritual battle that literally took three weeks of the time of David, it's interesting the way the battle came about. And then finally, this angel was able to get through to Daniel to answer his prayers. So one of the things I want to mention about angels, they do seem to be bound by the physical nature of some things on earth. This seems to be a battle of transit, not a battle on the ground. So I believe it's spiritual warfare. And then they don't have the omnipresence of God. God is everywhere, all times. The angels seem to be sent and blocked or, you know, uh, uh, able to do what they were sent to do and then leave. But they're not always with the person. In other words, I think Gabriel bringing the message to Mary that she would have a baby by the Holy Spirit. Gabriel didn't just stay with her the rest of her life. He came, brought that message, and he left. And that's very different than the omnipresence of God. So that's one of the different, the, the limitations between, um, or four angels, and I think for all the demonic forces versus the omnipresence of God. What other comments on that? Any other comments, questions there? Anybody? Okay. Um, I do, I wanted to read too about the um, presence of an angel with Manoah. Let's look at Judges 13. Joshua Judges 13. And I'm going to read a few highlighted uh, verses. So I'll kind of fly through here. And uh, But as always in Judges, the story starts with the decline of Israel. 13.1, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, so the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. A certain man, Zorah, named Manoah, from the clan of the Danites, had a wife who was sterile and remained childless. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, you are sterile and childless, but you're going to conceive and have a son. Now see to it that you drink no wine other than or other fermented drink and that you eat nothing unclean because you will conceive and give birth to a son. No razors we use on his head because the boy is to be a Nazarite, set apart from to God from birth, and he'll begin the deliverance of Israel from the hands of the Philistines. So he used to be a Nazarite from conception. Nazarite description is in number six, if you want to look at it later. So the woman went to her husband and said, a man of God came to me. He looked like an angel of God. Very awesome. I didn't ask him where he came from, and he didn't tell me his name. But he said to me, you will conceive and give birth to a son. Now then, drink no wine or other fermented drink. Eat nothing unclean because the boy will be an answer I got from birth till the day of set. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord, O Lord, I beg you, let the man of God you sent to us come up again to teach us how to bring up the boy who is to be born. I think it would be really handy to have an angel available to help teach us, guide our children. Mm -hmm. um, that's, a, that's a pretty awesome prayer there, honestly. So God heard Manoah, and the angel of God came to the woman while she was out in the field, but her husband Manoah was not with her. Here again, it seemed to be a physical limitation. He came, he went, he came back, and you know, he came to Mrs. Manoah, but he wasn't there for Manoah, at the, or Manoah wasn't there for him at the time. Uh, the woman hurried to tell her husband, he's here, the man who appeared to me the other day. Manoah got up, followed his wife. He came to the man, and he said, are you the one who talked to my wife? I am, he said. So Manoah said, when your words are fulfilled, what is to be the rule for the boy's life and work? The angel of the Lord answered, your wife must do all that I told her. She must not eat anything that comes from the grapevine, nor drinking wine or other fermented drink, nor eat anything unclean. She mm -hmm. must do everything I've commanded her. You know, it's always been kind of a venture to me as to whether uh, Manoah just didn't trust her or found this too much of a story to handle or whatever. But it it's nice, obviously, that she told the truth and the angel backed that up. I think that probably was overall good for their relationship. Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, we would like you to stay until we prepare a young goat for you. The angel of the Lord replied, even though you detain me, I will not eat of your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, offer it to the Lord. Manoah did not realize that it was the angel of the Lord. So it's interesting in several scriptural examples, angels say, you worship God, don't worship me. And we'll talk about a couple of those probably next week. But it was clear that the angel didn't want to be given a gift. He wanted to be 
uh, acknowledge or, or only simply known as the messenger of the word of God and that any worship offering should go to God. Then Manoah inquired of the angel Lord, what is your name so that we may honor you when your word comes true? He replied, why do you ask my name? It is beyond understanding. So Manoah took the goat and, and uh, sacrificed it to God. And then the flame blazed and the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame. Verse 20, seeing this, Manoah and his wife fell with their faces to the ground. The angel of the Lord did not show himself again to Manoah and his wife. Then Man Manoah realized it was the angel of the Lord. And here's an interesting response, I think, from Manoah. We are doomed to die. He said to his wife, we have seen God. But his wife answered, the Lord had meant to kill us. He would not have accepted a burnt offering and grain offering from our hands or shown us all these things that he told us now. So then the woman gave birth to the boy, named him Samson. He grew and the Lord blessed him. And the spirit of the Lord began to stir him while he was in Mahanath Dan between Zora and Eshtel. So obviously things came about, but that uh, is prophesied. But that also was, I think, a very significant issue that the angel didn't want to be worshipped didn't want to be remembered by name and didn't want to be detained any longer even though Manoah had asked that he come and you know help him raise the child or whatever he, I think just gained the information right was the big thing so in our last few minutes any other questions or thoughts on that by the way all right so I'm happy for you to interrupt any time. And, uh, you know, if you have a question or whatever, it's fine. It's just harder online than in the classroom, I know. So not that I've ever been interrupted in the classroom. Right, Steve? <laughs> Don, Donna, you, you and the Well, never mind. Okay, so now let's say Genesis 3. Let's talk about maybe the... So we've talked about angels. We'll talk about angels a little more because of spiritual warfare. And we've mentioned cherubim, seraph uh, passages, which I'll I'll bring up. Well, or the mention I'll mention the passages probably next week. So I think it's a value. Now we've talked about some of the heavenly realm. We need to talk about the unheavenly realm, the realm of Satan. So in that realm, I do want to mention. I think it, and I almost forgot to mention this earlier. I'm going to turn over to James chapter one. I think it's important for us to keep perspective on temptation, um, punishment, the will of God, the interruption of the will of God from temptation to us. And so I'm going to read uh, James 1, 12 through 18. And then we'll be back to Genesis 3 after just one other interrupting verse. But they're good verses. James 1, 12 through 18. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. Because he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire... He is dragged away and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Okay, so clearly there, God does not tempt and cannot tempt because of his goodness. But he says in James, James says, by uh, each is tempted when by his own evil desire, he's dragged away and enticed. So that seems to imply both the nature of humans being, you know, because of the story that we're about to read in Genesis, the idea that we can be like God and make decisions that we feel are right up there with the way god would make decisions for us obviously we're wrong about that and that we're dragged away and enticed and so someone seems to do the dragging away and enticing 
So I think it's uh, an important thing to keep that perspective that sin is not from God. We sin when we are in opposition to the will of God. There are many people who think that bad things happen to them because God has caused them. And I think it's all about our response to what happens because we are human and subject to physical forces on earth. For instance, I hear all the time people say, you know, how could, I have, how, how could God have given me this cancer? Um, and I would suggest the real answer there is either your human body developed a cancer um, because humans are by their very nature fragile and going to die of something at some point, or that Satan has presented that so that you would doubt God and his blessings, or that the reason that you have that much like job was put under temptation by satan with god's permission was so that you could grow in your relationship with god and learn spiritually from it but it's not that god gives it to you or does bad things to you clearly from scripture so then i'll just read one other quick verse here um i think I lost that verse again from earlier. What was? I don't know why. I keep, ah, oh, here it is. I keep looking at the wrong verse for some reason, but this is the verse I have in mind is uh, 1 Peter 5, 8. Be controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. I always think of that verse Ed, when I think about the verse in James about being hauled away and enticed you know pulled away and enticed because that visualization of the lion pulling you away is so vivid and i think that's that helps keep in mind the the nature of spiritual warfare is it's not a little deal it's not oh you know if we could divert this soul from god that'd be okay it's an active process i think uh to try to get our allegiance away from god and towards satan so let's look at the original sin in genesis 3 now the serpent who was uh now the serpent was more crafty so this is genesis 3 1 the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the lord god had made he said to the woman did god really say you must not eat from the tree any tree in the garden the woman said to the serpent we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden but god did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And I think that is the ultimate in sin, is the pride feature of feeling like we can be like God. Instead of being subject to God and to God's will for our lives, that we can decide how we will be in the presence of God or otherwise, rather than following after God wholeheartedly or whole soul. And I think that's, um, that's a, really the root of basically any sin is that pride issue of thinking we know better than God. You know, if we, if God says, do not steal, and we decide, well, we're clever enough to be able to steal without being a big deal, that's trying to be like God and disobeying his command to not steal, for instance. So when he, when the woman, verse six, all that the fruit of the tree is good for food and pleasing to thine, also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open. They realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man's wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what's this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you among the livestock and all the wild animals. Your crawl, you will crawl on your belly 
and you will eat dust all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So that's the classic prophecy of upcoming battle with Christ that he felt he had killed Jesus when the uh, Romans uh, and with the Jews impetus crucified him and he was dead. And I think that's the bruising of the heel where Satan thought he had conquered Jesus. But then, of course, Jesus rose from the dead, crushing the head of Satan and becoming one uh, right at the right hand of God in the throne uh, room of heaven and all those things that came about when he was raised from the dead. So I think the key scripture here or the key concepts I want to pull out of this and then we'll close for tonight because it's all six is that first the serpent was you know said to be more crafty and then was cursed and told he'd crawl on his belly you know we almost all would think for obvious reasons that that would be going from some form of maybe lizard maybe a komodo dragon uh type of a you know something of legs something of climbing ability to be up in the tree holding the fruit showing eve you know good stuff here come eat it and then they he was cursed to be like snake on the ground writhing in the dirt and below all the other creatures, quite literally. And, uh, you know, that it sounds a lot like that. You'll crawl on your belly and eat dust all the days of your life. I think the challenge there is, you know, this maybe it was what happened. Maybe this was a climbing reptile and then became the snake. But I think that doesn't mean that Satan is only a snake and that the serpent is always inherently evil although I could be convinced of that easily because I don't like snakes. But the when we look at this, though, where does it say devil or Satan? Or does it? And I'll answer you. I'll answer me. Is yes, it does. Where does it say it? And it's tricky. It's an unfair question, honestly. But at verse 13, the Lord God said to the woman, what's this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me. So that is the root term that is translated as Satan, the deceiver, or the devil, the deceiver. There are two terms that Satan is translated as. One is uh, deceiver. One is accuser. Both of those refer to trying to get someone away from the truth. And specifically, we would view an accuser, like, for instance, how Paul in Acts was intermittently arrested and put on a, the, um, the confession seat, if you will, the, the um, attack. You know, he was attacked for his teaching about Jesus, and he was accused. So the accuser seat, or like the, it's like being arrested and, and charged. That's sort of the view of how this term is. And deceiver is a little less active. It's more like trying to get people to think they're like God and make their own decisions rather than yielding to the will of God. So both of those are translated from this term that is in the original Hebrew phraseology, the serpent deceived me. So Satan and the devil were not mentioned here. And in fact, we'll review next week because we're out of time now, that the first mention of Satan or the devil is actually way on down the road in 1 Samuel and or in Job because Job was is in the Bible later than 1 Samuel, but was almost certainly written far before 1 Samuel. So the real answer is when Satan was first mentioned is probably Job. The first order of mention is actually from 1 Samuel. Satan and devil are not mentioned in Genesis. And I think that's a, just something to keep in mind, too, about the nature of maybe how we view Satan versus spiritually how the term Satan is, is about deception away from the will of God. And that then would play to the verse in James that says that when your own evil desire gives birth to a sin, when you get pulled away and enticed, somewhere in that human form or human nature of 
knowing, having the knowledge of good and evil and trying to exploit that to our benefit, which we do in error as humans, but we can do successfully uh, when we follow the will of God. We don't have to exploit our own behavior. We can live in the will of God and being pulled away from uh, our situation into sin, like the view uh, the, presented in First Peter of the de devouring lion. So I hope all that makes sense. Any questions real quick here before we make Johnny and Donna late? Well, you're not going to make us late. We're 615. We're doing good. Oh. Oh, okay. Well, we can drag this on. No, you didn't. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> I don't that. My problem is I never can think of a thing to say. So I, I was hoping maybe some of you had some comments. Anything? Any questions? There's Pat. Oh, Pat, is Pat out of the, uh, the guilt box? All right. So I did want to, speaking of Pat and his uh, spiritual recovery here, but good to see you. Um, the, when we view the, uh, the accuser, it's interesting to me that over in John 15 through 17, when, John, when Jesus says, I will send you the counselor, the Holy Spirit, when I'm gone to help you in your spiritual life, that that term, the counselor, is like an attorney to argue your case before the court. So if you have sort of the, the prosecution and the defense, Satan's the accuser, the Holy Spirit's the counselor to help you on your walk. And I think it's an interesting overarching issue of choosing right from choosing wrong, choosing right over wrong, and being right with God spiritually. What else? Anything else? Okay. Well, I'm sure I'm blessed that you guys joined us tonight. Appreciate that. We'll try to do each Sunday evening at 5. I am aware that in two weeks at Super Bowl, I don't know how much that would matter to anybody. Uh, we'll kind of decide a week before, I guess. But um, for now, we'll plan to do weekly through this study on um, spiritual warfare. And I do want to mention, I'm using it as a side reference, primarily just like to use scripture, but this book by Joe Beam, Seeing the Unseen, if you happen to have it or know of it, it's very good on spiritual warfare. And he has some questions that you can ponder this week that we'll also talk about next week when talking more about temptation and Satan and such. And those are, he, he has these ideas or these questions for us to consider in terms of whether we feel like we're under spiritual attack or someone we know is under a specific spiritual attack. And the thought there is, of course, that if Satan is somewhat bound by time and earth, which we'll talk about next week, too, when we read Job, um, and the, like the Prince of Persia, the King of Persia tried to detain Michael, the archangel, then there's a physical limitation. The serpent was the crafty one in the Garden of Eden, but he wasn't everywhere. So if we feel like we are under specific attack by Satan or his forces, more tempted than usual, consider these things. Are you confused about what is true? Have your beliefs about God, the Bible, or the meaning of the Bible, Bible passages, gone through any major changes recently? Other than presumably if you've just become a believer, that's a good major change. If it's a different major change, it could be a challenge. Do your new views justify doing things you once believed were wrong? Are you reasoning quite differently than you did when you were at the most dedicated point of your spiritual walk with God? Do things that once brought you pain or mourning now have little effect on you? Is something in your life absorbing so much of your emotion that almost everyone and everything else are losing the levels of importance they once held for you? Are you craving more of that something or someone which is becoming the focus of your life? Is God losing his place in your life because the something or someone you're focused on is crowding him out? After you became involved with this person or thing, did your emotions about God increase for a short period, then gradually diminish such that you, you no longer feel strong love for God? And are you doing things that you once thought were wrong now wanting to do them more often with greater intensity and no longer even think about whether they are right or wrong. And I think that's pretty interesting. We'll talk about that you know, again next week. So 
Again, thank you for joining us. Blessing to me and let's pray and we'll dismiss.